Lord God, we are so thankful to be able to come into your presence today. Lord, I ask that your Holy Spirit would just be upon this message, that you would allow it to land exactly where you want it to, Father God. Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, um, this is going to be part two of Mark's sermon last week. We are actually going to finish the book of um, Hebrews chapter 10. Not the book of Hebrews, but just chapter 10. We're going to pick up in verse 19 and go through verse 39. There was so much good stuff in this, I just didn't want us to um, leave hanging. So I want us to pick up in verse 18, which is kind of where Mark concluded last week. And this verse says, where there is forgiveness of these, there is no longer any offering for sin. And he gave us the word expatiation. And that means that not only are our sins forgiven, but the record of their existence is removed. And um, one of the things that I, I think Mark had touched on is that in a lot of uh, cases within our, um, our criminal system, uh, a criminal will go, he will serve, he or she will serve their time, they get out, and then they have this record of being a felon, and even the title of a felon holding over their heads. Unlike that, when we are forgiven in Christ, Christ has taken on the title of, of sin and shame and all of that thing, and all of the stuff that comes with sin. And in return, we are given the uh, the title of innocent. And, and I find it interesting, if you watch a, uh, a crime program, especially when they go into the courtroom and the, the jury comes back with their verdict, it's one of two. It's either guilty or not guilty. It's never innocent. And even though we are not innocent of our sins because we've committed them in the eyes of God because of what Christ has done, has done on our behalf, we are deemed innocent. And that is an amazing title for us to have. So the the response that we we should then have in our own hearts and minds is that now that there is no longer a penalty for sin, we do away with that which was used in the past to try to forgive us of our sins. And that was the sacrificial system. And that's exactly what has been done. It says that um, the there is no longer any offering for sin. This would just be like us saying, okay, we're going to tear down all of the jails because now there's no longer a penalty for our crimes. We're going to go into the uh, courtroom and we're always going to be um, deemed as not guilty. Be and, and if that's the case, then we would no longer need jails because there would be never a penalty for any crime that had been committed. We're going to pick up in Hebrews chapter 10, verses 19 through 25. I'm going to read, we're going to read this in three different sections. And I've, I've entitled my sermon, and you can follow along in, um, if you go to reviverancher.org, and then you click on the uh, the sermon bullet the bulletin. It'll have um, all of our announcements as well as the notes for my sermon here. I've I've entitled this the sermon sandwich. In um, coming from a business standpoint, I've been in a supervisory managerial role in the past. I've had um, employees that have worked under me, and what I uh, do th this is a commonly used uh, format. When you're having like an employee evaluation, what you will do is you will start off with something positive, then you'll dig into some of those areas of, um, of need where there should be some improvement, which can be sometimes viewed as negative, and then you end with something positive. So you have this three layer sandwich, each bun on the top and the bottom is something positive, and then the meat of that discussion is, is something negative. And just because of the, the formatting of this particular sermon, we have these three different uh, paragraphs, and it was positive, negative, positive. I was like, man, that's 
That's like the perfect sermon sandwich. So that's what I entitled my sermon. And we're going to go through that, beginning with that uppermost layer. So Hebrews 10, picking up in verse 19, he says, Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh, and since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience, and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stir one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. So <clears throat> we, we've got to remember this verse here is now in response to the definition that Mark gave us for expatiation. We're forgiven. We're so much, we're so confident that our forgiveness is true and permanent and eternal, that we've removed the system for, for even um, conducting forgiveness of sins, the sacrificial system. And now, what is our response to be in how we live our lives in uh, reference to this truth? And he says, we now enter into the presence of God with three things, with confidence, without wavering, and with full assurance. There's a story of um, a Bob Dylan concert. If uh, you're too young to know who Bob Dylan is, Google it. Some fairly good music. Uh, so in 2001, Bob Dylan was going to have a concert in Oregon. And 2001 is a year that if we were adults and you were alive, you remember as the month, especially in September, of when 9-11 occurred and forever within the timeline of history, American history, that is a significant date. Uh, I was working as a flight attendant at the time, and um, I had only been flying for about four months, and all flights were grounded for a week. Luckily, I had literally just gotten home the night before from Orlando, Florida, and I tuned into the news and I was watching all of this occur. And so from this point forward, the security levels at any kind of a public event were on extra alert. And Bob Dylan and his crew decided that, hey, we need to have extra, um, you know, uh, scrutiny on anybody that comes into the venue. So if you've ever seen Bob Dylan, he's he's a little bit older now and he was he even looked older back 20 years ago. And he's got long hair and he's got kind of a, a scraggly uh, beard. And he was out behind the venue smoking a cigarette. And it was probably about 20 minutes before showtime. And so he goes back into the gate that he had come out of. Well, there's three security people there and they're younger. And he goes to try to get in. He didn't have his backstage pass with him. And they did not allow him entry into his own concert. <laughs> <laughs> the scrutiny was so high, but Bob was fairly certain that he should be allowed to go in or many fans would be disappointed. And after they got a hold of some people on his crew, um, they finally were able to convince the three security people that he was legit and he should probably be let in. And later on, he actually thanked the venue for um, upholding the security uh, scrutinization levels that they had that they had previously requested and they actually had a good laugh about it. But this is something that I'm using as an illustration to show you that he, with full confidence, without wavering, with full assurance, said, I not only said, but demanded entrance into that place. And with that same kind of um, confidence, we are to enter into the throne room of God. We should have a new ex expectant attitude to approaching God which is different from the former attitude that we had. That former attitude was one of reluctance and shame because we were always being constantly reminded by the enemy about our failures and regrets. I have been standing in this very spot in the past preaching 
and the enemy will try to put into my mind some, you know, remembrance of, oh man, this week, even this week, you dropped the ball, man. I can't believe that you think that you have the right to be up here to tell these people about God and about all this stuff. You are such a hypocrite. And I have literally had to like fight those voices back. And so I am taking on this, this new attitude and going, you know what? I don't have to disagree with those um, accusations, but I do have to say that, you know what, as, as bad as I was, I am good in Christ because of, I'm good with God because of what Christ did on my behalf. He goes on to say that our conviction should be contagious as we stir one another to love and good works. And we do this by going where God's people gather. I just want to recap that little verse. It says, and let us consider how to stir one another up to love and good works and not neglecting um, to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. So he says that we can encourage one another by going where pe- going where God's people are gathered. We go to encourage and we go to be encouraged. The world's hostility is so pronounced in this day and age that we need a place of refuge. A gathering of believers should be a place of refuge. It shouldn't be a place of ridicule. It shouldn't be a place where we where we tear each other down and talk about each other behind um, our backs. It should be a place where we are all able to go and to be uplifted, to to share our weaknesses. To it should be a place of healing, and so this is exactly why it is that we gather together so that we can refortify, resource, and actually retrain one another because we should be learning from those who have gone before us in the faith. The next little bit of scripture that we're going to get into, Hebrews 10, 26 through 31, is the meat. And it's a little bit, the meat that can be a little bit tough to chew at times. This is the the, the paragraph which I'm calling the apostasy warning. Now, an apostate is basically someone who once believed and then later on they turned their back on those beliefs and they rejected them. Beginning in verse 26. For if we go on sinning deliberately after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a fearful expectation of judgment and a fury of fire that will consume the adversaries. Anyone who has set aside the law of Moses dies without mercy on the evidence of two or three witnesses. How much more punishment do you think will be deserved by the one who has trampled underfoot the Son of God and has profaned the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified and has outraged the Spirit of grace? For we know him who said, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, and again the Lord will judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Man, there's a whole lot that we could dig into here. And basically this verse, this is one of the verses, there's, a, there's another verse in scripture, is where we get the idea of the unpardonable sin. There's basically no longer a way for us to be saved. If we silence the Holy Spirit in our hearts, then he no longer convicts us of our sin and we're done. We're left in that state of unforgiven sin because we have pushed and offended the Holy Spirit. And we have to ask ourselves, well, how do I know that I'm not guilty of committing this sin? Well, the first thing would be is that you, if you care enough to ask this question, then you don't have to worry. Um, If the Spirit still convicts you of sin, if it stings just a little in your spirit when you think about those things, you're still safe. Because the Holy Spirit is our advocate. He is the one that that stirs that up in, in our hearts. And he's like, you know what? Let's get right with God. 
and, and this is not to say that our sins haven't been forgiven if we ask Jesus to come into our heart. It just means that, you know what, we need to clear the slate. We need to real, realign his preeminence on the thrones of our life. Because that's really what happens is that we get out of alignment. We need to we need to put God first. We need to allow our spirit to communicate directly with his Holy Spirit, put our soul into alignment under our spirit that is taking direction from the Holy Spirit, and then we put our flesh in line under our soul. That's kind of that perfect alignment that we have with God so that when we are able to relate with the world, and that's kind of where we get the cross, us with God, and then us with the world. And I know the Catholics, they do some, I think the Catholics do something along those lines. And it's it's kind of a cool reminder of, hey, where I need to be with God, and then this gives me the freedom to be that way with one another on this world. So my stance in when I look at a lot of people who may fall under the category of an apostate is that their salvation probably wasn't genuine. And I say that because of we can look at the, the parable of the sower and the seed in Matthew chapter 13 where he talks about how the seed is sown on different kinds of soil. And he says that some of that seed was um, devoured by, by the birds and it never really landed. Um, some of that seed, it landed in the shallow soil and so it was not allowed to take root or root as my wife always corrects me about how I say root from the Midwest. Uh, <laughs> or that the, the seeds fell, it started to grow, and then the thorns actually choked that out. So what we have here is that we have that maybe it grew for a season. It may even, the, the person may even have learned how to speak the lingo of someone that, have sa that was saved. They started living a lifestyle of someone that went to church and didn't swear and didn't smoke and were my old Bible professors, I said, don't smoke, don't chew, and don't meet those that do. And um, <laughs> they learned for a while, but there was never really any connection at a very foundational level with them and God. When the next season of their life came upon themselves, they fell away and they, they rejected that, which they seemed to have believed at one time or another. And, and Sean and I have talked about this as far as, well, what are your thoughts on if a person falls away from salvation? Do you, and, and we both had kind of talked and I said, well, you know, in my heart, I believe that they, that they, they weren't really genuinely saved. Now, the big picture of that is that only God knows. I have loved ones in my own life that I pray for diligently this day because they grew up in a way where they, they seem to demonstrate all of the, the characteristics of a person that genuinely loved God. I was talking to a buddy of mine that I hadn't seen in like 20 years, and I was just kind of sharing that with him. I said, yeah, I'm, I'm really, my heart is really pricked because of this. I'm really concerned. And he said, well, how old are they? And I told him, and he goes, you know what? Don't even worry about it. When I was that age, I fell away from the church, and he goes, they'll come back. And our job in, the, in, in response to those is to pray for them, to pray for their salvation, to pray for that opportunity where God would be able to intersect their lives in a way that would be impactful and bring them back to their first love. Imagine having an inkling of understanding of God's grace and mercy and then rejecting it. That would have to be true sadness. I think more so than those who went to hell ignorantly, never really having been familiar, it would be more so a constant hammering in your mind to go to hell knowing that you had rejected the very grace and mercy that could have saved you. I want to share about who, when I was growing up, was someone that I thought of as the apostate. He was like the, the perfect example of like what an apostate could be. And he was actually, he started out as a preacher when he was 17 years old. And when he was 23, some things, he, he sat down with his parents and he said, you know what, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give up. And he was like a Pentecostal preacher. He would travel around and do these big kind of tent revival meetings and stuff. And he sat down and he, 
He told his parents, I'm going to get out of the ministry. And they were like, well, what are you going to do? He said, I'm going to become a comedian. He goes, if I can make them laugh in church, I can make them laugh anywhere. And his name was Sam Kinison. He became one of the most hardcore comedians, uh, not family friendly material at all. And over the, this last week, as I was kind of preparing for this sermon, I started uh, re-watching some interviews that he did with Larry King, that he did on Johnny Carson. And he was actually fairly candid about his previous life as a preacher and then now as a comedian. And he got caught up in this whole lifestyle, very, very hard lifestyle of drugs and alcohol. And uh, he makes a joke uh, when he came out to do one of his comedy routines. He says, folks, I've been sober now for 17 days, just not all in a row. (laughs) His whole departure from his faith seemed like he was really committing apostasy. But yet, when you would talk to those that knew him, they would tell you that his reverence to God was still very much intact. In fact, one of the other quotes from Sam Kinison was, you can make them laugh, but you can't make them happy. It takes God to do that. He was said that when he did his comedy, that it that he enjoyed the response that he got from those that enjoyed his humor, but he really enjoyed the response more when he was a preacher because he knew that lives were being changed. And uh, Sam Kinison died. Uh, he was uh, killed in a head-on car collision on the way to a sold-out comedy show. His family was driving behind him in another car. And uh, when they they got to him, he they saw him looking off to the to the right, and he seemed to be having a conversation with someone. And he was arguing, no, no, I, it's no, I don't want to go, I don't want to go. And then finally, he had the sense of resignness that okay, I'm ready. And then he passed away. Nobody knows what that conversation was about, who that was with. We we can make guesses, but in the end. The real good news is that we need to continue to pray for those because only God knows the end of the story for each and every one of us. And we should do our part to do all that we can do. Okay, so that's the meat of our sandwich here. And the last one is positive. It has a few sprinkles in of the spices of negative just to just to make it delicious. We're going to conclude our sermon today with Hebrews chapter 10 verses 32 through 39 and it says but recall the former days when after you were enlightened you endured a hard struggle with sufferings sometimes being publicly exposed to reproach and affliction and sometimes being being partners with those so treated for you had compassion on those in prison and you joyfully accepted the plundering of your property since you knew that you yourselves had a better possession and abiding one. Therefore, do not throw away your confidence, which has a great reward, for you have need of endurance, so that when you have done the will of God, you may receive what is promised. For yet a little while, and the coming one will come and will not delay. But my righteous one shall live by faith, and if he shrinks back, my soul has no pleasure in him. But we are not those who shrink back and are destroyed, but of those who have faith and persevere their souls. There's two parts of this lower layer of this sermon sandwich. There's the caution and then there's the encouragement. So the caution is this, don't allow sufferings and struggles to make you waver or worst of all apostatize. So he's basically saying as you continue on in your faith, the struggles are still going to be there. You're still going to suffer at a certain level. However, do not grow weary in doing good and don't grow weary to the point of giving up. I myself, I'm a no drama kind of person. And when people talk politics around me, I tend to be agreeable, which is not to say that I'm necessarily in agreement with their point of view, as I really don't have an opinion and I really don't care about politics. It doesn't really drive me or depress me one way or the other. I believe in what the Bible says about the ruling authorities. I believe that God has ultimate purpose in whomever it is that he puts wherever he puts them. I believe that my responsibility is to pray for them, 
to obey the authorities that have been put into place, not to blindly necessarily agree. And if there's reason to disagree, there's protocols and formats that we can go about to try to get things changed. But at the end of the day, my I'm not upset or cheering for who gets elected or who who's not elected. However, the challenge is that sometimes it may not seem like I'm standing in truth and that I'm simply getting swept away in the worldliness because I am so agreeable. And so that's one of those things that I need to work on. I need to make sure that I am standing in truth and that that truth is very clear. So the encouragement that, that we have from this section of scripture is don't give up or give in when it gets tough. We're to recall and remember those former hard times and the grace that sustained us during those times. He says that that same godly endurance will carry us through till the end. I hear the tone in these final eight verses. God is for you, not just now, but until the end. It sounds like a coach in our corner. It's, He says, it's just a little while longer. You can do it. Listen to these last few scriptures starting in verse 37. It almost sounds like a halftime coach giving his team that little pep talk. He says, yet a little while and the coming one will come and will not delay, but my righteous one shall live by faith. And if he, if he shrinks back, my soul has no pleasure in him. But we are not those who shrink back and are destroyed, but of those who have faith and preserve their souls. I want to end with the scripture in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 16. He says, Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Let us draw near to the throne of God. If you have a prayer request, enter boldly without wavering with confidence up and have somebody pray with you, agree with you for whatever it is that you are struggling with. And as we have enjoyed this perfect sermon sandwich today, know that even for those that look like they have fallen away from Christ, let's not put in the final verdict. Let's do what we can do. Let's pray for them. Let's remember the reality of the world that we live in, that there's going to be struggles, there's going to be sufferings, and that we can look to God, we can look to the strength of Christ, we can enter in with confidence into the very throne room of grace to find help and mercy in our time of need. Let's pray. Father God, it is such an amazing opportunity to walk with you, to serve you, to be commissioned by you, to be set on the mission that you have for each and every one of us. Father God, let us walk with endurance this race that has been set before us, looking to you to uh, give us that needed strength in those times when we when we are falling weary, when we when we have those struggles, when we have those challenges. Lord God, we thank you. We give you glory in Jesus' mighty name. Amen.